So now let's go to the circulation. The most common type of shock in a trauma patient is hypovolemic shock. They have lost volume, all right? They have lost volume. Now, I have a question for you, test question. Which do you think is more sensitive and happens earlier, tachycardia or hypotension? It's tachycardia. Tachycardia happens straight away. The problem with tachycardia is that there's a lot of things that can cause tachycardia. Fever, pain, anxiety, things can cause tachycardia, but when a nurse calls you and tells you that you have tachycardia on this patient, you gotta think about early shock. So what about hypotension? Guys, hypotension is a later sign. And a lot of, I'm gonna teach you an expression which is a little bit, not a, a great expression, but it's called swirling the drain. You know what that means? You know when you uh, use the sink and you see the drain swirling? The term, if you ever hear it in your residency, that you're swirling the drain, a patient swirling, it means that they're going downhill. And hypotension, hypotension is usually a later finding. You're kind of swirling the drain. So obviously, obviously, when you have shock, due to hypovolemic shock, what is treatment? The treatment is fluids, fluids, fluids. And which fluid would we use? Would we use our maintenance fluid or would we use one of our resuscitative fluids that we talked about in the last lecture? We would use a resuscitative fluid, which is normal saline, which as I told you in the prior lecture, is a volume expander. So then the question comes, where do you put the IVs? When I was your age, we used to put central lines, subclavian lines, internal jugular lines in everyone. Patient came in with a hangnail, we would put a central line in there. A central line is not a good line for volume. The good line in test question, the first spot you go to where the nurses will always go to, short, fat IVs. They're short and they're fat. And you could get a lot of fluid through that. If you get an antecubital, which is your first choice, your second choice is your saphenous. You all have saphenous veins. And how do you access it? Where is it? It's anterior to your medial malleolus. Anterior to your medial malleolus. So that's your second choice if you've got to get an IV straight away. Let's say you can't get the saphenous, which is anterior to your medial malleolus. Then you would do femoral. The femoral vein is as big as my thumb. But you use it, but the danger of a femoral vein is what? It's a dirty area, it's in your groin. But you can get volume. That's your third choice if you can't get the first two. And finally, if you can't get antecubital and you can't get saphenous, and you can't get femoral, then you put in a central line with one exception. If you are going to monitor the patient, CVP or whatever, then you would do a central line. But in otherwise situations, you don't put a central line in unless you don't have any other access. So important, I'm gonna go through it again. This is an order. You first try antecubital, 
that doesn't work. Saffin is it, that doesn't work. Femoral, if that doesn't work. Central line with the one exception, if you have to monitor the patient, meaning CDP, stuff like that, you put it in the central line. So now you're all thinking, you're saying, well, what about an interosseous line? Well, one of the things you'll learn, those of you who have children, and when you, if you see pediatric patients, they're very round. They're round. Their chest is round. They're not kind of like flat anterior posterior like we are. And you might say, well, if you have a child come in and they usually have no anticubitals, they don't have a saphenous, their femoral vein is a small vein, put a central line in them. Oh, it is hard to get a central line in a kid because they're so round that when you try to put in the line, sometimes you get a pneumothorax. So in children, more than adults, we do something called an interosseous line. And an interosseous line goes actually in the bone marrow, the bone marrow. And the most common location for an interosseous line is the tibia. Test question, tibia. Second most common is the femur. Are there other areas where you can go? Yeah, you could do the humerus, you can do the sternum, but by far tibia first and femur second. Now, is an interosseous line a good line? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. But test question, is the interosseous line temporary? or permanent. It is temporary. You do not leave an interosseous line in for more than 18 hours, 24 hours, because what's the infection you could get? Osteomyelitis, which is not a good infection. So interosseous lines are good lines. You will commonly see patients that are transported by the emergency medical technicians in the ambulance already shown up with the interosseous lines. Why? Because they have really neat little devices in their ambulance. They have a portable drill, battery operated, and they will very quickly, they'll go zoop and put in the catheter into the interosseous space. When I was your age, we didn't have those drills. And I remember very specifically using a needle and I was putting my weight on that needle and I thought for sure I was gonna break this kid's leg. So if you ever have the opportunity with the emergency medical technician folks to let you use their little kit, or in the emergency room, they have these kits too, to do one, please do it. It's very easy and, and the technology has made it much, much simpler. So I want you to try it, all right? Now, concepts, I'm teaching you concepts. Let's say that someone was shot and is in critical situation and your trauma center is two miles away. Do you resuscitate the patient at the scene or do you scoop and run? Meaning get the patient in the ambulance and get them to the hospital. You scoop and run. You scoop and run. Now that does not mean that you throw them in the ambulance and do nothing. It means that your primary responsibility for the driver is to get to the hospital. And while the other person is in with the patient in the ambulance, you do what you need to do, but you don't waste time at the scene. Now, why do I say that? Because years ago, the scoop and run was not a concept, was not a concept. And we used to resuscitate people at the scene we would put on things, maybe you would call mast trousers, 
this and that, we would actually resuscitate them there. It's not a good idea. Now, if your trauma center is four hours away, then obviously you have to resuscitate them there. But scoop and run, that is a very, very important concept. All right, a very important concept. All right. But again, scoop and run, scoop and run. Get the patient to a trauma center. Very important. All right, next. Patient comes in the emergency room with either a stab wound or a gunshot wound, and from their groin, blood is psh, 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 squirting out squirting out, all right? And the nurse next to you says, doctor, would you like a hemostat, which is a clamp, to stop the bleeding? You do not use a hemostat, a clamp. So you might say, why wouldn't you? It's sterile. It's, you could be accurate with it. Why wouldn't you? The danger of using an instrument in a situation like that is that you're blind. You're going through tons of blood and you could actually make the hole bigger. So what you do is you put your finger on it. You put your finger on the bleeding to stop the bleeding. And sometimes you will actually go to the operating room while your finger is on this. And they will prep around your finger until they get control of the blood vessel. So you use your finger. You do not ever blindly put a clamp, a hemostat, in the wound. 